Hey, time for dilly-dallying is over. Perfect is the enemy of good or done. It's 11 p.m. and I owe you guys an update on how my analog color correction circuit is working. There are definitely some uh, kinks I'd like to iron out, but rather than going into a diatribe about lesson learn, lessons learned, let's dive in and, and take a look at what we're doing here. So, what we have here is I am spitting out an HDMI signal from my computer. Um, it's getting converted into SDI, then going SDI to analog. Uh, and it goes through this device here that I'll get to in a second. And we're seeing the Luma channel here on the scope. And in the background, we have a plasma TV displaying that signal. So Luma is basically brightness, uh, luminance. It's going from dark to bright. So you've got that grayscale, that nice linear grayscale from black to white on the screen. If you remember from the last video, there is that uh, color correction curve panel. The default view is a straight line um, going from left to right. So that's kind of what we're emulating here with the gradient. You'll notice this uh, step here, that's the sync pulse. Um, anything that we're gonna be doing on this device, we don't wanna mess with the sync pulse. The sync pulse is important for the integrity of the signal. So this box over here, which I think I showed you in a previous video, um, takes the Luma signal in, spits out just this part of the signal over this RCA cable, goes through a device, comes back in here, then coming out of this guy, which is what we're seeing here, is the modified Luma plus the sync pulse. So as a quick reminder, we have three stages. We have a pre-amplifier, a post-amplifier, both that have offset, which allows me to move the signal up and down, and gain, which lets me change the slope, but it's off the screen now, so whoop, there we go. Um, so we can change the offset here as well, and gain, and at the output as well. The first thing to notice is it's really easy to get this signal in here outside of the acceptable voltage levels. Um, anything below this line here should, should be illegal in a video signal because that's reserved to your sync pulse. And if you start throwing the voltages down there, you'll lose sync and on the TV, you don't see it right now, but it's gone black, it says no signal. Uh, but you can correct for that by looking at the scope and getting it back in line. Likewise, if you amplify it too much or throw it way up, if I zoom out on the scope, you'll, oh, anyway, you get the idea. Um, the, the screen can't display it, so it just goes black. So let's get back to a more normal signal. Now the TV itself does a lot of work to try and recover this signal. I'm being pretty nasty to the component video signal. The TV is doing a very admirable job of recovering a nice gradient back there. So these three amplifiers are all pretty boring by themselves. The interesting stuff is happening with these eight knobs here, which control sort of that log transform and uh, transform and exponential transform that we talked about in the last video. And so you can see here, we're shifting up the bottom end and we can go like that and then bring the signal back a bit. And now we're curving out, we're adding this S curve. You can see it's going a little wild there. And we we'll restore it back to an appropriate level. We've got sort of this S curve down here. Um, what we're seeing here is a little bit of ringing from the transition where this device is turning off the signal and then turning it back on. Um, the transistors that I'm using in here aren't the ones that I designed this circuit for, so they're not great at high frequencies. Um, but you can see we're getting the desired effect that we're doing it at the bottom end. I'm driving it pretty hard right now really um, extenuating, extenuating, accentuating the effect. But now we can get our nice sort of curves. Now, so the purpose of this circuit was to try and explore the space of parameters for where these knobs are interesting. I don't quite have an answer yet because there's a lot of really weird things that you can do with this really basic topology. I've got the entire signal going black now. And even though sort of emulating this from a sort of spice perspective, 
um, it all sort of makes sense. Once you put the knobs in front of you, they feel wild and crazy. And I was trying to use this to find sort of the sweet spots for various interesting sort of transforms that you can do to this curve. And there are lots of really weird different regimes where you can find interesting things happening. I know you can't see anything on the screen right now because it's very dark because we're sort of violating the black level. Um, but you can get pretty nuts stuff happening where you start sort of actively using the ringing in, let's see if I can get us there, in these transistors. Come on, where are you? See, I'm lost already. I'm sort of losing myself in this. It's interesting. Um, this is my first time just noodling around with it. And I guess I have two takeaways. The, the first is sort of a, a, a sort of a basic sort of mathematical one, I guess. Um, there's so much interaction between how each of these knobs implements or impacts the entire signal that I spend a lot of my time sort of manually trying to restore the black level. Like you can find a really interesting spot in sort of that IV curve that I was talking about in the last video, but it only happens when the signal is not black. And so you have to shift manually, shift the signal back to having the right black level for the, you know, for it to meet the um, component video spec. And of course, weird things happen when you're well out of spec, like probably what you're seeing on the screen a little bit now. Um, but it would be super nice if I could work out an analog way to automatically adjust the black level. I, I think a better way, which I've been talking about with my collaborators on the broader FPGA project, is rather than using this sort of analog box which recombines the signals back together, it'll sample the black level as it comes out of here and automatically offset before it recombines to make um, the outgoing either component video signal or digital video signal. So that would sort of take care of that. So whatever black level gets shifted through these interacting things, just you know, automatically reset the black level. Um, that would be one thing. The broader lesson, and it's really hard to talk and sort of and twiddle knobs at the same time as I sort of get lost in it. But that's the second point. The second point is, it reminds me a lot of this device that I built here, I don't know, 20 years ago or so, uh, probably more than that. Um, this is a one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, six tap um, infinite impulse response uh, filter. If you're familiar with digital signal processing, you've probably heard of IAR filters. Um, they are a way of implementing sort of analog filters in the digital domain. But of course, being who I am, I built this completely out of analog components because I, I was pretty comfortable with digital circuitry and um, I wanted to learn more about analog. So I implemented an impulse, infinite impulse response filter uh, completely out of analog components. Um, and it was a cool idea on paper, but uh, when you look at sort of the transforms to transform you know, a simple low pass filter or a high pass filter into a six tap IIR filter, um, there's not a lot of linearity between what the tap parameters look like compared to say the frequency cutoff, Q and other factors of the filter. So you end up finding yourself that, you know, it's easy to comprehend sort of what each knob does from an equation perspective, but in terms of the sound that you're trying to get, um, it's a completely different parameter space for, from, you know, twisting a cutoff resonance frequency knob on a, a normal filter. It was interesting. Um, I don't know if it was useful. That's kind of how I'm feeling about this right now. I think I'm being thrown off by the fact that the black level keeps on getting messed up and I'm chasing my tail there. And because everything's so interactive, uh, when you chase your tail, you can sort of lose the effect that you're looking for. Um, but it's fun. And I think it's also weird that I'm just looking really at the scope. I'm not looking at the screen here. Um, and the image itself that I'm working on is pretty boring. It's a, it's a gradient. Um, probably not the image you were looking for in this video. Um, I want to sort of take my head away from looking at, you know, tweaking the knobs while staring at the circuit diagram, do some interesting video on the screen and, and just see sort of where I end up. 
Um, I may do that in a follow-up video with less talking and more just video. Anyway, I've been rambling. Um, sorry, this isn't coherent. I sort of wanted to capture my first attempts messing around with this, and um, maybe this is interesting. I find it interesting. Anyway, see you next time. Bye.